So welcome back, everyone. This is Chase Anderson, and today I'm joined by Dana Gleason. Um, you know, you've got you've got a long bio, uh, but currently Mystery Ranch. Um, previously, Dana Designs, Clutterworks, Mojo Systems. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing a few stops in between, but um, that, that's the high points. Those are the high points. Well, we'll talk some low points too. I, I think. Well, there's plenty of low points. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get we'll get into some of that. But um, thanks for setting aside some time. It's been uh, good to talk to you, and and appreciate you being willing to to document a little bit of this. As you know, we've been really interested in kind of recording recording oral histories of those who have been doing it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, there's just so many good lessons to be learned for students of the industry, people who want to break in, um, and documenting this history is important. Um, and when I've when I've done some 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 research on on just your um, you know history in the industry, you've you've done a lot of these podcasts, you've done a lot of interviews. Mm-hmm. Pe- people have come to you to to uh, talk through just kind of the history of the industry and your place in it. Um, so a lot of this has been well documented, but I'm hoping to tease out a few things that maybe questions you haven't been asked before. So thanks again cool. for taking some time. I'm, I'm Don't hoping. ask. In that case, do not ask me why we named it Mystery Ranch. No, I saw I saw that that question has been answered. So if if anyone wants that answer, there's there's the answer is out there on online. Just search that. So hoping to not tread um, over some topics that have already cool. been talked before, but want to hit some of the high points and some of the low points. Um, just to get some of the dates in place. But, um, you know, I, I like to start kind of these history of gear conversations um, back with what was your first exposure to product? Oh, my parents in the mid 60s, uh, my parents uh, took me to the Appalachian Mountains every summer. Mm-hmm. I actually, in from the late 50s, uh, became members of the Appalachian Mountain Club, and we did a lot of hiking. And uh, as I got into mid-teenage years, my God, you don't want to be seen with your parents. So started going out and doing more of my own. And, uh, you know, they had been more car camping and day hikes. And uh, then... Uh, kind of a seminal book came out um, called The Complete Walker by a guy named Colin Fletcher, Mm -hmm. which distilled a lot of how you would backpack into one book. And uh, that started me collecting more gear, getting my first Kelty BB5 pack frame and, you know, uh, getting into gear freaking over, oh, North Face or Sierra Designs for the sleeping bag. And, you know, just doing a gear weenie phase, but it's really much more important to just get out and use the gear, which I mostly did solo. Um, And I collected myself a pretty complete uh, uh, outfit together and, you know, done some overnight and two or three night trips uh, in some winter camping. And uh, this ties into an early story, which was uh, I was trying to figure out what I would do after the uh, freshman year of college, which I was mostly attending to avoid being drafted and sent to Vietnam. Mm. Um, where, where was, where did you go to college? I, Massachusetts Bay Community College. I was uh, on a program uh, getting me uh, set up to finish up at Boston University, but, uh, you know, that kept me going, and I did decent grades and, you know, was just uh, going through the motions. And uh, that spring of 1970, I guess it would be, I was uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And one path was I would get myself uh, a job at a place called Eastern Mountain Sports Mm. that uh, continues to exist in a horribly truncated form. At that time, it was the biggest uh, uh, outdoor set of shops in the United States. And, uh, or simply hitchhike out uh, to the Tetons and go climbing. But 
how to pay for that, I had no idea. You know, I was working at my dad's flower shop doing deliveries and such into Boston. And uh, I did an interview at the main location at Eastern Mountain Sports. And they hit me with, uh, okay, well, thanks very much. We'll call you, which is, you know, I even recognized then, go away. And uh, so I did. Although one of the things that went on was there was a piece of vaporware that had been, that had had pictures out in the field of something called the North Face Ruth Sack which was something we had never seen before, which was, you know, call it a probably a 50 or 55 liter pack that was closed with a zipper, you know. Uh, packs up to that time, it had, uh, you know, drawstrings, lids, European looking rucksacks, uh, things that looked internal frame, like now, were just barely, uh, being experimented with with the Low Brothers and uh, didn't come to market for another two years. And this Ruth Sack thing had been in the EMS catalog, which was a quarterly catalog for like three catalogs worth. And because of some experiences using that big old nice Kelty pack frame skiing, for which it was terrible, uh, you know, I badly wanted this particular piece of gear and you know how it gets to be when you fixate on something and you're young and all that well as a walking out of the bullpen of offices at eastern mountain sports at 4 30 in the afternoon on like a friday there was no one there and this pack which had only appeared in photos up till then um and oh yeah it's going to come out real soon now there was one of them on a desk and I was feeling a little snippy. So as I walked past, I said, yeah, I'll look at it. And I hooked it in my arm and walked out of the back offices into the front of the shop. And I looked at it and it was cool. There was nothing like that at the time. Um, they, they had done some pretty good design work. And you'll notice there's a qualifier there. And so I walked out to the front and uh, I handed the pack to the people at the register and they looked it all over and there was no price tag and they went, oh, there's no price. Um, I pointed out them the catalog they're handing out at the register. There it is, look, 49.50, it's really expensive, but I wanna buy it now. Um, and, uh, and sold it to me and that kind of set it with, well, I don't have the job. I got the cool pack. And, uh, you know, even then you could buy pockets like from Kelty that were designed to be sewn on. So I got a couple of the pockets, hand stitched it onto the pack. So it had this pair of pockets up high. Um, the whole two pockets on the back thing started early with me, I guess. And, uh, I hitchhiked off uh, into the uh, West and two days into the trip, the pack was really comfortable. It had everything I needed on it, sleeping bag strapped on top and uh, I'm hitchhiking, uh, going uh, past Brattleboro, Vermont and goes, and I feel it just shift on me. And it actually had the frame held together with aluminum rivets. And in two days of, hitchhiking and walking, one sheared. Mm. And that's why, you know, design is one thing, getting it to work is another. And uh, hitchhiking further west, I found a North Face dealer and marched in and demanded that they help me repair this and they wanted to send it to the North Face. And no, I'm on this trip now. So we drilled out all the rivets and put in uh, 5 16th marine bolts and peened him over. So I went off and to uh, the first off Rocky Mountain National Park and did some very easy peak bagging. Yeah, I had a rope and other stuff with me, but you know, I was solo pretty much. I mean, there was only one point 
point where I hooked up with someone who had a little bit of smarts about rope work and belay, et cetera, and, and climbed a thing called Rock Chuck Peak in the Tetons, which is a, a minor northern peak that it's just lovely. Mm. Did some other stuff in the Tetons, um, came hitchhiking back, and uh, I've had a number of adventures on the way. You know, you, you meet all sorts of people, some of them pretty weird. And uh, as I was hitchhiking, uh, coming into Chicago on, uh, what would it be, 94, coming in from Madison, I'm figuring that, you know, okay, I'm getting into the east. I'm going to do the straight shot 90 to get back to Massachusetts. And this guy in a Cadillac who was in the left but one lane swerves like crazy. Now, I'm, I'm standing there hitchhiking, trying to look presentable, hoping I can get in the car fast enough where they won't notice how bad I stink. Hmm. Um, you know, back, you know, I, I, I was not doing hotels or anything. I was bathing in streams. And when you start getting back into ag land, that's a different experience. Mm -hmm. But, okay, I ran up to get in because, I mean, he had to swerve across three lanes, stopped, cloud of dust uh, about 100 yards up, and I came running up. and. He unlocks the door. I open it, and he goes, "Is that a North Face Ruth Sack? Hmm. Old balding guy." Yeah. So, yeah, it is. Oh, go ahead and put it in the back seat. And you know, he poked at it a little and looked at it. it turns out he uh, ran a chain of backpacking shops called Camp Fitters Limited, hmm. and he'd been seeing the vaporware as well. Uh, apparently what I had gotten was one of the first three that were even prototyped. The first one they photographed and, you know, put it out there. Hey, it's this cool new thing we want to do. And, uh, you know, became classic vaporware. Do you still have it? So I wish I did. And I am looking for one and we will see what happens. They produced it for like two and a half years. Mm. Um, so essentially that got me my first job in the industry strangely enough because uh, after talking a while and talking climbing gear and they're putting in a climbing section in each of their like eight stores and uh, i became his go-to on what to buy which was seriously pathetic um i mean seriously chenard chrome molly hardware was just barely coming out mm -hmm. and the stuff we had been using up to that time. Yeah, there was something we'd heard about chocks, but they were essentially big old nuts, the kind of thing that would be used to bolt together train track ends. Mm -hmm. And then you drill it out and smooth it out and you might use that, but you were much more likely to be using soft iron pitons from Stubai and such. Mm -hmm. uh, we were still using uh, hemp rope for swami belts because when you were belaying, which there were no devices, uh, you weren't even stacking carabiners. You were belaying around your waist, uh, and uh, they were concerned about rope on webbing actually uh, getting weakened or uh, frictioned through. Um, it was a long time ago, Sonny. <laughs> well, I think I'd, clearly that, that person had to see something though, right? To be able to look at, you know, a new product at the North Face, evaluate oh, yes. it, understand yeah, yeah, yeah. it, right? Yeah. Well, and to recognize something that had only been in pictures while driving 60-something in your big boat Cadillac. In any case, uh, hitchhiked back home was still the plan was I was going to go back and do my sophomore year and uh, the whole law had changed so that uh, college no longer kept you out of the draft mm. and I thought about it and I'd been three months out on the road I was a different person than when I left so I went and hitchhiked back to Chicago with 40 bucks in my pocket 
and uh, took up the job at the shop. Didn't just take up the job at the shop. I rather grandly announced that afternoon because this was a subsidiary store. This was not where the boss was. So he had just said, look, I got a new guy for you. He'll probably be an assistant manager. He knows climbing gear. We're working with him. Listen to him. And I parlayed that into, well, and I'm also your new nighttime security. And so I lived at the shop for two and a half months. And uh, <laughs> that was probably did, the first hint that I had some kind of obscure mind control powers. Did they know uh, that? Did the boss know that? Uh, he, he learned it in about a week or two. <laughs> and I guess he had a sense of humor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that was my start in the industry. <laughs> what what did that retail experience give you? I know that's one thing that you recommend um, for anyone who wants to get in. It was the best thing. It was the best thing. I was pretty shy. Uh, and uh, like in my high school, you had to pass a public speaking class in order to graduate. And I got a mercy C at it. And I learned I was capable of projectile sweat. Uh <laughs> But after six months there, I got asked to speak before a women's group about cross-country skiing, which in Evanston, Illinois, it consisted of, oh, it snowed, so you went out to a golf course and cross-country skied. Hmm. Um, but I realized after I did it that I was not in the least uncomfortable, and uh, that's when I realized there had been some real changes that had happened. Um, plus I had an apartment by then instead of going, uh, six blocks away to the YMCA and stealing showers. Uh, when, so, when, so what, so I guess that, that was probably a really formative time then just, just to oh, be I, surrounded I by more gear, right? It's like you could do more oh, than just look at the things in the catalog. The gear yeah. And compare and play with it. And, uh, every weekend I'd be, by then I'd gotten a motorcycle. Woohoo. And uh, so I was riding up to Devil's Lake in Wisconsin and getting a lot more climbing time. This was uh, more or less a, we called it at the time, not a sport climbing area, but a top rope area that was uh, amazing quartzite rock. Right. And, you know, I, I got a lot more climbing time and reached my peak of, uh, oh, geez, I've, I climbed to 510. Woohoo! And, uh, woo, I can lead 5'8". Whoopee. Uh, <laughs> it's the enthusiasm, not the actual talent. <laughs> right. Did you, uh, in regards to more the gear making side of things, I mean, you. I had, I'd done a bit of it by that time, except for hand sewing some pockets on, onto a pack. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of, I, I, I just ended up being a little more out in the edge than uh, they needed or appreciated. But, hey, there were some fun people, some uh, I can only call them punks, that uh, ended up creating a shop called Erewhon Mountain Supply, which exists to this time in the Chicago area. Um, and that shop really happened because one of the guys involved through a uh, couple of strokes of luck that are a much longer story ended up with enough money to import about $25,000 worth of climbing gear from Europe. And his big plan was to wholesale it to other shops and to hopefully turn over that money and build the business up. Um, the reality is the euros had kind of seen him coming and yeah, he got some cool stuff, but they also got to unload the worst garbage they had in the back of their warehouse. I mean, 110 centimeter long, demountable two-piece ice axes, size three double boots. Oh yeah, this is the stuff that's used on Everest, but we have size three through five. And like, oh, that's some obscure European size. That'll be a rank. No, that's U.S. sizes three through five uh, and great stuff like that. And it was stuff that would have sat 
in the basement of the house he was using as a warehouse in Old Town in Chicago, except that, God, we've got we've to make some more money. So we conned, he conned a uh, guy who had a building with uh, several vacant storefronts into leasing us one, uh, basically for six months. And uh, I mean, he pretended to give us a working storefront. And we pretended to pay him. Um, and we started a shop. And uh, at the time, companies really protected their dealers. It's, I mean, there was one Kelty dealer in all of Chicago. And uh, it was that way with, uh, you know, either ski shops that had some camping gear in the summer, or the Kelty dealer was called the uh, Chicago Canoe Basin. And, you know, they mostly sold canoes. And this bunch of raging punks who didn't know they couldn't do this stuff um, ended up not able to get the lines they wanted. So we found lines that were technically very good, but marketed terribly. Mountain Master pack frames, uh, Ascente sleeping bags and jackets from a company called Pacific Down. Um, this is also where we kind of got lined up with some early stuff you may or never been heard of, which was the California climbing community was kind of split between two groups of people. One group called the Vulgarians, mm -hmm. who a guy named Warren Harding, who uh, did the first, uh, you know, ascent of uh, Half Dome and, you know, took weeks to do it. And it was major engineering accomplishment versus Chenard and uh, Royal and those guys who were much more European influenced were much classier. Yeah, we fell in with the Vulgarians. What can I tell you? And, but we would tell stories and we would not just, when someone walked in and asked for something, go, oh, we don't have that, sorry. We would talk to them, see what they wanted to do, use some of our experiences. And within a year and a half, we had the hot shop in Chicago. And all the stuff that we hadn't been able to get, they were offering to us, you know, North Face, okay, we're ready to open you up. Well, you guys, I got Trailwise. It's great stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, that gave us a little bit of a reputation. And what came of this when Marty Stilling, who I acknowledge as my sensei and many things, who's still around, uh, last seen running a shop up in Milwaukee. Uh, he's in his 70s now. Uh, he came back from a trip to Chicago or to uh, California where we were going to talk with getting a few lines. And he came back with this good looking stuff that had a weird story. It was called Snow Lion. And their, their, their deal was they were building good technical gear, but they were building it in Taiwan. And everything was built in the U.S. at the time. And, uh, you know, the basic background plan was we're going to build good gear, but we're going to sell it for 25% under what everybody else is selling for. And we're going to make really good money. And the gear itself, really, I was a shop kid. Okay. I was really enthusiastic. I could tell a story. I knew nothing about business, but we went over the gear. He gave me the samples. He loaned me his pickup truck and he sent me off to the, well, initially the Northeast to open up shops. And so I'd come walking in and yeah, I learned about making appointments a couple of months later uh, <laughs> and would show this relatively amazing stuff and uh, did open up some dealers and a few of them actually succeeded. And then we got to hire an experienced rep who operated in the area because I was going from Chicago to the uh, Boston and New Hampshire area. 
Um, then I'd open up uh, what we call the Middle East, Ohio, Indiana, et cetera. Did it, uh, did the same thing, did the uh, going in and uh, showing people stuff and essentially oozing enthusiasm. Uh, and then real business people would get involved. And I did this in about four places and learned huge amounts about business, about shops, about gear, about gear manufacturers and when to believe them and when to go, you know, cut open one of those uh, demo sections of the sleeping bag that you sent us that was cut away and you could see the, uh, the baffles and the wonderful white down and these things were four baffle sections long and the two middle baffles if you cut into them which i did because i was by then making some gear and i needed to steal down for a down vest i was making <laughs> while the two outer sections you could see into had beautiful white down the intersections had this black and like a duck foot and <laughs> <laughs> and you start going, oh, this isn't all sweetness and light. <laughs> so with, with that said, the snow line didn't last very long, did they? Uh, snow line actually, well, first off, yeah, they were middling honest. Mm. And they lasted uh, really about four years. And mm. they changed a lot in the industry. And a lot of the stuff was pretty technically good. They were the second people to do any kind of well-built synthetic fill sleeping bags and coats for if you're in uh, ugly wet conditions. Mm. And one of the first groups of people I built stuff for were Jim Danini and a few other guys who were going down to uh, Torre Eger. And uh, you know, we, we ended up building waterproof sleeping bags with synthetic fill that were hideously uncomfortable, but they would keep you alive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just started learning more. And uh, I had started modding gear in between my first and second rep trips. Oh, okay. When I, that was when I had really gotten an itch on to modify basically a bag I had that was a cool little bag, but I wanted to put a hip belt on it. Mm. And the home sewing machine that I had gotten, which would work for doing frost line kits, which I did three or four of, it would not do pack fabrics. It would not do heavy webbing. And uh, there was a sewing machine dealer two blocks away and down there and ended up talking them into giving me uh, six months credit on the machine uh, with a hundred dollar down payment. And, that was after I had actually hurled my home sewing machine uh, out the uh, back door balcony of the second floor apartment we were in, in this building that also had the store. We actually had three apartments in the building and the store on the ground floor. And we had set up routes on the front of the building and we had half destroyed the apartments doing routes inside. And that was really seriously in anticipation of, you know, having, you know, you know of, of the whole indoor climbing thing. Right. But as I say, we were punks and freaks. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, I mean, that was pretty common among the industry, right? That's that the, the industry was built on the punks and the freaks, right? Yes, because this was not normal. Mm -hmm. This was not how people looked. Yeah. This, I mean, that this is now, what a lot of normal clothing looks like. This is a 20, 30 years of evolution and a generation of people who weren't particularly commercially acceptable. Right. Growing up, enough, having enough success so that others got into it. Well, if anything, if anything, um, shows how different the industry is today than than when you got into it look at vf corporation buying supreme, <laughs> buying supreme. absolutely i, mean, I haven't had a chance to get us with anybody about that yet and the thing is we've been looking like since the 90s we've been involved in certain elements of skate culture and observing on the streetwear side 
and playing in parts of this world. A lot of the stuff we do in Japan mm-hmm. tags in with companies like uh, Beams and Ships and all the other folk who play in this area. They think we're cool. Huh? Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I've been exposed. We've been doing some drops, collaborating with uh, certain people, the karyology stuff lately, mm-hmm. and learning how to approach it and learning the power of collaborating with culture leaders from other areas. And instead of some little day pack that, you know, has the virtue of it exists, getting a name or a color scheme on it, doing some cool. Mm -hmm. Now, am I doing that personally? No. But I'm surfing on it. I'm having fun pushing it along within the company. And most right. companies, even now, in the outdoor space, oh, God, I shouldn't eat. I'm revealing secrets. Oh. Uh, most companies in the outdoor space are hardcore outdoor. Mm-hmm. And frankly, they're stiffs. Um, yeah, we're hardcore outdoor. We're doing hardcore stuff. Uh, solving problems in the military and the fire side. But the things that we are doing in the outdoor space and the lifestyle space are pretty cool. Now with Clutterworks is something I did in 75 to 78. And then we recreated from say 2012 and actively through 2016. Um, and it's something I'm proud of having done, but the 2012 version, we were looking at putting into men's fashion shops and other things because it was all part of, whoa, heritage outdoor stuff. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the coming thing. And we kind of made a discovery that most of those shops, you couldn't even ship them COD. You had to get the cash in advance or they would just kind of check on you. Mm. Um, you know, one of the interesting things out there is this is where Topo came from. Hmm. And Topo over the last few years has desperately been trying to move into the outdoor space from purely being in the fashion space because you can make some money there. Um, and the reward for actually serving out your apprenticeship in the fashion space is that uh, initially, oh, good, you get into a department store. And the department stores could move some numbers, but the department stores have a department called the chargeback department. And they aren't satisfied unless you end up owing the department store more money than you initially invoice them for in Mm -hmm. the, uh, in the, in the vein of chargebacks and discounts that, Oh, the stuff didn't move in, four weeks so okay you need to give me 20 percent off and you know write Mm -hmm. me a check send it back etc and we actually decided that you know there's markets we don't need to be active in (laughs) well there's uh, a there's a benefit to just doubling down on the outdoor community right because that's that's a community that is passionate that you can develop a following from that is going to come back to you that wants to develop a trust right i'm going to have to give you another little secret that's what the outdoor community technically theoretically is was to a much greater degree up through the mid 90s but how many sports do you partake do you skateboard nope no cycling road road cycling hiking camping uh fishing no mountain biking Mm -mm. How many winter sports? Oh, uh, cross country, downhill, skiing. How many different uh, roof rack type elements do you have for your Subaru? <laughs> you know what? I don't even have a Subaru. Cool. Good on you. <laughs> I've, I've had several, but uh, now I'm fat and happy and have a uh, Audi. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, Subaru is the number one car up here in a lot of places. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And there'll be a rocket box. There'll be a bike rack. 
there will very likely be a kayak crack, mm -hmm. et cetera. People in the outdoor tend to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Back in my day, Sonny, uh, <laughs> Uh, people might backpack or they would climb. They might do both, hmm. but you wouldn't see a bike rack. Um, we wouldn't see a kayak, although kayaking became a big deal for me, but it kind of took over from climbing because I guess we had limited attention spans. Hmm. Um, the group that is committed to what they are doing and do it hard and truly live it, it's the hunting world mm. in a big way, right? In a big way. And uh, I didn't come into this through hunting. The other thing that seemed very odd is, you know, as a climber, we were into ethics and arguing about stuff. And was that valid? And oh, God, you used bolts, et cetera. Man, the ethics fight in the climbing world are a little slap fight compared to the ethics fights in the hunting world. Yeah, there's some Billy Bobs out there who are mainly drinking beer and driving a pickup truck, but the great majority of hunters truly care about what they're doing, truly care about the species that you can say, oh, they're hunting, oh, they're killing, but in actuality, the species that they are coexisting with. Mm. And uh, it gets to be a longer story than that, but don't simply assume that uh, the other is uh, in any way, shape, or form not as pure right. and not as caring as you are. Well, that's, that's the interesting thing is that you, well, prior to COVID, right, you had outdoor retailer and mm -hmm. you have SHOT Show. Yep. And it's a, it's, there's a clear division, right? But uh, well, it, there, there is. And uh, absolutely, there is a clear division. But that's because you think the shot show is mainly a hunting show. Right. And it's not. Yeah. Uh, law enforcement, there's a military section of it. Rifle shooting and handgun shooting is its own separate sport or sports from hunting. Um, the actual hunting show that is by far the most effective hunting show and the difference between these two groups is like the difference between hot cross country skiers and downhill skiers. Mm. Um, and that is called the ATA show, the archery trade association show. Mm. And that is the bow hunters show. Mm. And there are no, uh, no, uh, no, no guns of any sort. It's entirely about bow hunting. And when you're bow hunting, you have to be creeping up basically to within 50 yards. Yeah, a long shot could be 100 yards almost, but you got way too high a probability of missing and then having to spend another day or two days tracking a wounded animal. Um, or you have to be able to creep up within, say, 20 yards. And try doing that with an antelope, you are talking some serious skill. Yeah. And, oh yeah, luck. <laughs> um, and the ATA show has all of the hunting clothing, all of the stuff for trying to deceive your prey, and uh, all the bow stuff. And it goes on either in Indianapolis or Knoxville, sort of like every other year, around the 9th of January before either shot or OR. Hmm. And uh, that is where all the serious uh, look and tell and business and stuff in the hunting world is done. When you go to shot, yeah, there will be the clothing and all the rest of it for more of the shops that are mainly on the gun side. But all the buying's already seriously been done. In the last few years at SHOT, we had our hunting stuff in addition to what we really do SHOT for, which is encountering military people. Mm. Um, and it's an international show in terms of dealing with uh, military folk, folk from the special operations community all over the world. Um, and that's a totally separate thing right. uh, for us as well. Um, 
But and that's why shot seems much more alien. Mm. If you went to ATA, you'd go, this is outdoor with bows and arrows. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, with, that makes a lot more sense. With hideously dangerous looking razor heads and things. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it is interesting that, that uh, they're, they're not so different. And a lot of the values espoused between those two groups, I, I, I imagine, they would align in a lot of ways. Is it, yeah, they, they really do. But it's really only people that do both that tend to recognize it. People that do right. one or the other, really other the other. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to take a step back. Where I that that was really interesting. Um, but I'm going to pull us back to to Snow Lion again. Oh, um, that. I, sure. I was gonna I was gonna mention <laughs> um, my first exposure to Snow Lion as I've kind of been digging into the history was seeing. Mm-hmm one of their iconic covers of one of their catalogs. It's still probably my favorite cover of any outdoor brand is the stone mountain lion face. It's incredible. Um, it is. I love it. And, and it's, that it's existed, probably my favorite. Well, the thing is that existed because snow lion was forced to change its name from snow line. Right. right. And, uh, what happened there was, you know, they named the company Snowline and they were growing and other people were doing stuff. And as it turns out, the folk at Eddie Bauer, who were not corporate in any way at the time, mm. um, were getting a little pissed off because they had trademarked Snowline as the name of a coat, like oh. back in the 1930s. Oh, wow. And so there was enormous shootout in court between about seven different companies. And yeah, Eddie Bauer owns Snowline. So the folk there at Snowline cogitated a while and came up with, well, it sounds similar and we can make up some great stories. And they were great about making up stories, man. That It's just so educational. Um, and so they decided to call it Snowline. And this picture resulted, and it was a painting at the headquarters but they realized oh iconic and they put it on the first snow lion catalog and it went great now you may think that snow lion or snow lion ended up dying out because of uh you know bad business decisions well you could put it that way or they got beat and uh, you know didn't sell well they were selling great I was a snow lion rep up until 1978 and I had already been doing clutter works for two and a half years, but I had still been out in the road repping. And the irony is for most of that time, clutter works wasn't wholesale. I mean, we simply sold in the Bozeman area Mm -hmm. up until a year before when we finally made a contact with the Marmot folk who were as crazy as we were. And that is a bit of a delineation from most of what we would call your normal outdoor companies. Right. Um, that's a different story. Uh, we'll get into that. A, the statute of limitations is entirely run out. Uh, well, I, I'm curious but, on, on Snow Lion. You know, let's go on Snow Lion a while. Yeah, no, I was just one more thing on them. You mentioned sure. them making product in, in Taiwan. This mm-hmm. seemed really early for outdoor companies to be moving production the overseas. First. They were the first. It was the first. Because the, that, the move was largely the 90s, right? When things started to move over? Oh, At no. It started North moving over in the... Uh, in the uh, let, let, let me just tell the story. Yeah, that'd be great. Because things started moving over around 1980 in mm. actuality. And a number of other things happened, and I've covered this before, but let's call it. Snowline was building stuff, uh, anything of down or tents or whatever that they were doing in Taiwan. Now, at the time, Taiwan is as close as you could get to China. At that time, China was in the ending throes of the Cultural Revolution. Mao had just died in 1978, uh, 77 actually, and a group called the Gang of Four, who were more Maoist than Mao was, were in charge. 
and still doing, uh, I believe the technical phrase uh, we call it is crazy. Um, and, and China was a basket case. And uh, Snow Lion was uh, working in Taiwan. Now, Taiwan at the time was uh, essentially where a Chinese party called the Kuomintang uh, had uh, retreated to uh, because they ended up coming on, on the short end of the Chinese Civil War of 1947. And they dug in there and they were anti-communist and we were backing them like crazy. And they were mostly some thugs. Um, you had to know generals, let's loosely call them generals. What that means is warlords uh, in Taiwan in order to do any business at the time. And uh, this gentleman who was one of the three owners of Snow Lion had learned some of this just coming out of college. I believe he you know, had been roommates or close friends with the Taiwanese and realized there were some opportunities. And he went over to Taiwan and he was hitting up one of the generals who had some sewing plants. Uh, these people were entirely uh, you know, making their money off the commercial side, but otherwise, yeah, they were uh, you know, anti-communist, et cetera. And he actually married a general's daughter and learned the language, which was not Mandarin, um, and uh, you know, had promised the general he would make him uh, huge amounts of money. And they started building this stuff, and the prices were great, and it was built well. Now, I made that little story, told that little story about the black down and duck, you know, yeah, they cut some corners here and there, um, but for the most part, I mean, that was just a four baffle section of a sleeping bag that was supposed to serve as an example for the rest of the show. So, yeah, what's saving a few yawn? <laughs> um, most of the stuff was actually very good quality and spurred better quality happening in the U.S. Hmm. They ended up creating a very small plant because they were into technical stuff and, uh, you know, down sucked in really wet environments. So they were putting out the first real mass production polar guard sleeping bags and coats, mm. which were a freaking, because you couldn't at the time stack cut polar guard, because if you did, essentially the fibers got enmeshed in the blade and would turn into gooey plastic. And eh. so they were cutting this stuff out one layer at a time. And the guy who showed me this was another relatively heavy set fellow named Wayne Gregory hmm. in between his time at a 16 and just before he started building backpacks again. Uh, he had initially done some pack frames. We didn't hit it off particularly well or anything, but hey, I was a rep and he was, you know, running some very frustrating production in Richmond, uh, California. Mm. Now, uh, how things go, little side story here. I was a rep for Snow Lion. I had opened up a large swath of the country for them. I knew the line very well. Uh, I was also the second sales rep ever for Wilderness Experience. And a lot of the Snow Lion guys were also Wildy guys. More stories there later. They're great people. But again, things are a little more complicated than they're some ways pre presented. Uh, we're selling the Snow Lion stuff. There's other things going on in the background. Uh, the Alaska Pipeline is being built. The biggest engineering pro or, uh, uh, the biggest engineering program up in the north anywhere at any time, and the first. And they didn't know how they were going to maintain 3,000 miles of pipeline. And one of the things is the weather, which can go bad any month of the year. Uh, not just uh, the winter. 
and they decided that they would put a survival cache down every kilometer. And that survival cache had down parka, coats, mucklucks, mittens, et cetera. And it had to be built. And Snow Lion won the contract. Freaking enormous contract running in the background. Helped them a lot. More on that later. Uh, they were doing their own synthetic stuff. They were doing well. Um, in very, very early 78, I had settled in with a territory that was Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming to be a rep. And um, I had by far the highest per capita sales in the country uh, operating in that area. The problem being, there's nobody up here. Uh, <laughs> Idaho at the time had like a million and a half people. And uh, Montana had a, maybe three quarters of a million. And Wyoming had a quarter million. And it was just not enough people to earn a living off of, even with wilderness experience and Loa boots and all the other stuff that a rep who's semi-decent accumulates. So I'm talking to the guy who is essentially uh, the head of my rep group and de facto the sales manager at Snowline, who was Marty Stilling, my old sensei. And uh, I'm hitting him up that, oh, wow, he, he, we had a rep go out of business and he had uh, Utah and Arizona and New Mexico. And uh, man, I need Utah. And Marty is, we're talking on the phone and we would talk like crazy. We we're brothers, you know, from the old uh, Erewhon thing. And Marty hits me with, well, yeah, but the California rep needs some more territory too. So here's my proposal. He's going to get Arizona and he wants part of Utah. Part of Utah. Okay, well, that's interesting. I mean, if he wants to move up into St. George and, you know, he's doing Las Vegas too, that makes sense. No, no, it's a little different than that. He wants, okay, I'm going to have, I can give you all of Utah except for the strip from Provo to Logan. <laughs> <laughs> So where now, everyone lives. Marty didn't actually understand that's where everybody yeah. is. <laughs> I mean, I would be like, oh, I could go to Price and I could go to St. George, the whole end of their end of the state. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Marty, I have a modest proposal for you. I quit. <laughs> that was the moment, a huge moment in my life when I became what I like to call unemployable. Uh, <laughs> I got tired of doing stupid things for stupid people that weren't going to work anyway. And so I was no longer a snow lion rep. Now, the timing actually turned out to be pretty cool because at the NSGA show, for fall, anyway, it was about six months later, there's a really wild happening of snow lions there, North Face, Marmot, you know, everybody is there showing their stuff. But at the end of the first day of the show, reps from the North Face go over to the Snow Lion booth and say to those guys, well, what are you doing? And they go, the North Face guy goes, well, no, what are you doing? Uh, the feds have gone and padlocked your headquarters. And they go, what? And a few phone calls are made and there's people looking for jobs the next day at the show. Um, what had actually happened was, remember I mentioned the Alaska pipeline thing? Mm -hmm. uh, remember I mentioned the plant in Richmond and all of that with uh, my friend Wayne? Uh, as it turns out, that particular contract was supposed to be Barry compliant, mm -hmm. as in the Barry Amendment. Everything as made in, in the U.S. 100% U.S. labor and materials. Yeah. The only U.S. labor and materials on the stuff that went into all that, which was all good stuff, was the U.S. flag and the hand stitching that went on. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah. And someone let that particular dime drop two years later. Mm. And the feds came in and basically, uh, you know, charges were preferred. They came in, they padlocked the place. Everybody was out. And that's what happened to Snowline. Mm. A year later, the, uh, and there's, a, there's a little bit different story about some uh, crazed parties and fights that happened amongst the reps and other people who got fired. But that was two years later. And statute of limitations may not have run out. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, so with, with – uh, But the gentleman, the gentleman who was operating in China mm -hmm. was still in China. And uh, there was a warrant out for his arrest. And uh, worse than that, his father-in-law was, Bill, what happened? Bill, how am I going to get my money back? This is, you know, am, am I, you know, you're under arrest. Now, is there anyone who can, you know, give us a million dollars to, make up for this thing going away, et cetera. And Bill talked a lot and talked fast. One other thing that was an absolute fluke that happened was uh, a few weeks before in China. Remember China? The gang of four had been deposed by a gentleman named Deng Xiaoping. And a week or two after that, Deng Xiaoping decreed a major change in policy. It's glorious to get rich. And you're all on your own. <laughs> and so Bill ended up being the first American who had any knowledge of China, Chinese culture, and maybe, you know, there's one group of Chinese, uh, you know, but an appreciation for what goes on. By the way, there's about 17 different languages spoken in China. And culturally, there are huge differences, even among Han Chinese. And uh, it's not really a unified culture. It's becoming more so now. Um, but it's been uh, a lot of work to get it there. He went into what they call villages, and we would call major cities, and talked to some of the folk who still had some chunks of power or had managed to maintain, you know, some kind of uh, value or money. And the thing is, in China at that time, it was a pure subsistence economy. And we can go on about, oh, man, they're exploiting the workers at Nike plants, et cetera. But that kind of thing is so far better than knowing your children will starve and die if the harvest doesn't come in well. And as it turns out, sowing, we can have a long session about uh, development economics, but sowing is pretty much just about the first thing you can do with a undeveloped economy to turn labor into actual value of some sort. And uh, basically, Bill went in and, uh, you know, initially was uh, doing bed sheets and other things for department stores because, I mean, you know, getting them to, you know, letting them know they could pay half the price and they get this going. And China actually had a cotton crop. But then uh, because of his experience and knowledge of the outdoor industry, he started building stuff for the major players because he knew those folk and they knew him. Mm. And uh, basically, it was like a drug for the outdoor industry. I'll be paying one-tenth the labor. And at that rate, Bill was still making huge money. Um, he was making great money on getting this stuff built in China it goes to the outdoor companies. They get to sell it. They make some better money. It has all the makings of a virtuous circle, but there's one tiny problem. The outdoor industry as a whole has gone into a down decade where if, if things are shrinking, 
And if your business stayed the same from one year to the next, well, it's a huge success story. And in the late seventies, these companies that were run by basically hippies and freaks and such anyway, some of them were getting bought up. Uh, do you know that Sierra Designs for a period of time was owned by Cummins Diesel? No. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I've got a few other stories there. So is that um, what, that, is that what motivates them? That was at a time the... where diversification mm. was a corporate uh, byword. Sorry, right. go ahead. No, I was going to say, so is, is that kind of the motivation? You start to see a lot more of these acquisitions that are happening late 70s into the 80s. Oh, and they were happening simply not, not because the outdoor companies were that great. They were happening because uh, they were happening because it was corporate fashion. Mm. And these much larger companies, you know, oh, we should diversify. And what it actually meant was if you owned a company you know nothing about selling to people that you probably despised, it may not have been the best uh, uh, actual uh, recipe for success. Right. And like most corporate fashions, on a five-year cycle, it's like, no, everything you knew was wrong and we're throwing it out. Sierra Designs ended up being owned by uh, the company that uh, also owned K2. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's more stories there. That's a different thing. Yeah. What we're dealing about with right now is the transition from U.S. to Chinese labor, basically. Right. And uh, my friend Bill, who I knew from being a uh, rep and the second rep ever for Snow Lion, um, as far as everybody in the U.S. is concerned, he had disappeared without a trace, except for the people who were actually getting all their gear built by him. And that started out with being the North Face, and then Sierra Designs, and then uh, m many other companies. Now, what also started happening at that time is these companies were breaking even if they were lucky. This was not a huge, up, vibrant business in the 70s and the 80s. That started coming on much more in the late 80s. Again, thank God. Um, we were in it because we simply do it. Um, and what ended up happening was these companies would be buying Bill's stuff. He'd be making great money. And then they'd go, well, the banks called our note. And we're probably going out of business if someone doesn't buy us. And Bill came up with a solution. He ended up assuming the debt for these companies and continued to sell stuff to them and made huge money doing it. And he ended up accumulating the North Face, Sierra Designs, uh, Head, Sportswear, um, um, uh, uh, Alpsport, and about nine other outdoor companies. He ended up with so many of these things, he had to create a company to hold them and do the overall uh, production for them and, uh, well, run them as well. And that company was called Odyssey International, which operated out of Hong Kong. And uh, I learned about this. I had my first hint of this in 1985 when we were essentially private labeling a new technology pack uh, through Marmot Mountain Works, and it was sold as the Marmot Mountain Works packs. I'll be getting you some Marmot catalogs from the time. And these were cool packs. I mean, we had frame sheets. We were building men's and women's. Uh, I had done an entire fresh design for them. Um, the company I had been that I had a very had the majority ownership of called Mojo, where we were building camera bags for a number of years. We 
got very good with polyethylene plastic, with uh, ripping off battens from sails, uh, strips of fiberglass, and a number of other materials that I used in camera bags and introduced into the backpack world. Um, my original company, Clutterworks, in the fall of 78, I had taken on a business partner. He was a very charming fellow when he was probably half looped. Uh, turned out to be a bad choice of partners. Couldn't get him back out of it. I saw, I saw bad things coming. And so rather than try and get him out of it, I, uh, okay, let me get out of it. And uh, I'm not a great negotiator. I got $6,000 in a flipping sewing machine. That being said, $6,000 was more in the late 70s than it is now. Might be 15 grand now. So that, was, that, Clutter, that was Clutterworks or Mojo? That was Clutterworks that I sold out of. Mm. And I started Mojo. And that Clutterworks, we had the pack line. We've done hats and the Gore-Tex Gators, the first I know of, and a lot of other things. But uh, I got got connected with a guy who was a very good photographer and active in the photography business. We developed a vest for him that was a real standard and well-liked thing for, oh, all told about 15 years. Um, I ended up developing a bunch of modular camera bags that you could carry on your body and then some bigger hip sacks and camera bags. And the folks at Clutterworks, no, we're, 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 we're climbing a camping company. We that photography stuff. So I got to walk away with the photography stuff. And uh, I got into the house that I still am in today. It looked a lot better than what's behind that, or looked a lot worse rather than what's behind me right now. Hmm. Um, and uh, started... I maintained decent relations with them and they let me cut at Clutterworks at night mm. doing our hot cutting process, which we made it up and it made packs that lasted. Uh, and within six months, I ended up moving into a tin building and we were bigger than what Clutterworks was. Clutterworks had the good graces to go bankrupt not once but twice in the following three years. Mm. Um, guess I made the right choice. Yeah. And, and, uh, and Mojo you, became my first million dollar business. Wow. And then you ended up obviously picking up the trademark for Clutterworks again. And, and it's, it's well, it had been abandoned there. for probably 30 years. Wow. It's not, it's not like it was something that I had a need or a lust for. <laughs> um, it's just that uh, in 2010, when we had started working with uh, Japanese and Koreans after they had rediscovered that, oh, dana -san, he's at Mystery Ranch. Uh, the first time where uh, Korean and Japanese distributors came over, I mean, I'm a designer. I got an ego. I've got examples of everything I have ever done. And we showed them the Clutterworks stuff. And there was this, you know, very loud teeth sucking noise. And... Oh, Dana Son, we must have this. And that's when we uh, went and took a look. And oh, look, there's there's no trademark on Clutterworks. Mm. I mean, Clutterworks is just a Germanic sounding name where we thought it meant climbing factory when indeed it actually meant rock foundry. Uh, mm. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had not paid it much attention for a very long time. I've been busy doing other things. Oh, and when you are producing a classic, it is usually very problematic whether you realize you're building a classic. Right. I right. mean, it's, it's just stuff where I was happy to get out of that company. And it's stuff I was proud of doing. And it's stuff that, to a large degree, came right out of my head in a two-week period of design. Um, there's a thing uh, used to be called flow state mm -hmm. and uh, I'd lucked into uh, the time, the right to machinery and some solitude to actually do something really new to me. 
Right. And that's what Clutterworks was. So, you know, and the stuff that we turned out, I mean, it, it is copies of what I did back then. It was pretty awesome stuff. Hmm. Um, I'd love to get into the derivation of that stuff because I was hugely uh, influenced by Rivendell packs at the time. So that, that was kind of my next question. I was going to bring up Don Jensen, Larry Horton, Rivendell. What, what were some of the other companies that are, or designers or individuals that were influencing you at the time? Like, in like terms, a Rivendell. Rivendell was a, a serious, a, a serious uh, influence. And the thing with Larry Horton was Don Jensen had already died. Mm-hmm. He created this stuff the basis for it over in England and he's riding around on a rainy flipping day and got hit by a car. Right. But had, had created this stuff had, had supported himself building some of it. And then the Rivendell that happened in Idaho in an old church mm-hmm. on the road into Ashton or out of Ashton rather, um, you know, the, they, they were entirely separate and Don Jensen was, you know, sort of like a saint figure there as he should have been. Yeah. And uh, he had also done work on a tent called the bomb shelter, yep. but he was no longer among us. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up using a Rivendell pack for a couple of years and I went through like three of them. And properly used, they carried really well. By the way, we should get back to uh, the freaking history of how the outdoor industry got concentrated mainly into one company and went from China. But hey, oh. we can skip around here. I'll leave no, tastes. We, we will. We will. I, I want to get back to that for sure. But um, yeah, it, we, but it's the Rivendell pack carried great, but it had some huge flaws. Mm. They put a corduroy back on it to, quote, absorb your sweat. And it did absorb your sweat. And then when you took it off and put it on the ground and, you know, drank some water, had a snack or whatever, when you would put it back on, that would have cooled down via the miracle of adiabatic expansion. And when you put it on your back, you'd be putting something that was soaking wet and 30 degrees colder than your back on. And Mm -hmm. it was one of the worst sets of moments. Uh, of using any bit of gear you'd be praying that your soaking wet back would get warm again because uh this this was horrible and they ended up putting a plastic layer in there so that uh, it wouldn't end up seeping in through the pack cloth that it was made from and that was one lesson i observed right then and there um and this is stuff i'd been doing using since 73 Mm. and in august of 75 when i turned out basically all the mojo or excuse me clutterwork stuff in a two-week period when i first moved to bozeman we turned out the first terraplane and a key part of the first terraplane was nothing on the back to absorb moisture Mm. it is stupid and bad (laughs) and uh, the ultima thule put canvas on the back which let it continue with the same problem. Now, the Rivendell was a zipper accessed pack, bottom zip, and they had really goofy tailoring, kind of, oh, well, this is what your hip and back interface is shaped like, and you'll just stuff your sleeping bag in there, as opposed to being able to put a sleeping bag in a stuff sack in. So I got away from that tailoring and actually having a horizontal divider, which gives you a spot in the pack that is less densely packed than the large major open areas. Mm -hmm. They had the vertical um, divider, which was fripping genius and original to Don Jensen. But then they went up into a kind of a bulbous zipped area. And the bulbous part was good. It was usable area. But if you didn't stuff a Jensen-type pack tight through the whole area, 
it would sag and it would uh, not be near as uh, comfortable as one that was stuffed perfectly, which meant that you had one volume of gear you could take. And they weren't very friendly to lumpy parts like your Svea stove, mm. uh, or especially if you had an Optimus 8R, say, which is a box. Uh, so after going through a couple of the Rivendell packs, I was going, they, they are, you know, they're worshiping their founder. They're not going to change anything, I'd asked. And uh, that's when I came up with the Terraplane. And we didn't do a horizontal divider. We did have a bottom zip. You could simply cram a down bag in a stuff sack in there so you could pull it out and not have to carefully uh, guard the bag from the zipper. Uh, also, if you had a sleeping bag you'd been in, like in the fall or the spring, and it had some frost on it, and you're trying to stuff that thing into the space of a Rivendell, your hands would get just cold enough so that you're in the exquisite pain phase, not the numbness phase. And so there were these certain pain trade-offs with uh, the Rivendell pack and, uh, you know, versus how well it carried when properly used. Well, By the well, way, when a designer says properly used, what they're saying is this is going to suck most of the time because most people aren't going to properly use it. Right. Yeah. There's a big disclaimer there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the Rivendell is an interesting one to me because it's it's a company I was never familiar with before I started diving into the history. It's one that could be forgotten, right? And yes, uh, they're but they're still influential in a number of places. Yeah, right. And and is that's where I wanted to do some of these oral histories to document and tell that story and and have the archive at the university. We we have quite a few of their their catalogs. Um, and I've actually done an interview with Don Wittenberger. And Eric Hardy, who now own, mm -hmm. own Rivendell, and Don Wittenberger of the Yak Works. Well, Rivendell has actually had, yeah, two or three lives. Right. Yeah. And Yak Works, they did their own thing, and then they acquired Rivendell. And I think, I mean, is, is do they have any business existence anymore? Uh, they, yeah, they still are. So Eric Hardy is the one who's selling packs up in Washington. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like they sell some product online, but I don't think they're doing anything super, you know, anything big, but no, they're um, making a, you know, a living for three or four people, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. So, Which and I know is Don, not to be sneezed at, but no, yeah. and I know Don Wittenberger um, is, has been trying to, to recreate the bomb shelter. So there's, um, it, it, it was a fun conversation with them. I, my goal is to get to Larry Horton, but that's been, that's been difficult to get a hold of him. Um, to see if he's willing to tell that story, but um, hopefully one day we can we can do that. But let me tell you, the statute of limitations is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with that, any other designers or companies that that stood out to you as you oh. uh, kind of informed your designs, or what not to do? Oh, the much more of that, but that's more business stories. But I had you know, we found that. We got into business at enough of a level to where we were pretty freaking engaged making our own mistakes as opposed to copying other people's mistakes. But mistakes are how you learn. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying, oh, no, 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 nobody. Had, you know, people had effects. I mean, a lot of people had effects because when I started Clutterworks, I just knew from observing gear and had done repairs for a few years for people that we'd taken in through the retail store. And fixing things will teach you more faster than anything else. Um, by the way, shameless plug moment. There is a podcast called the Anchor Point Podcast. Mm -hmm. You can get it on all the normal uh, 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 things. Anchor Point is uh, fire, wild and firefighting based. Mm. And we have a series of podcasts. Their guy came up for a week. And there's a couple that are fascinating with regard to the human costs of being in the wild and firefighting space mm. uh, by our sales manager who had uh, been a uh, 
while in firefighter in several areas and running up through the management for a dozen years wow. before gladly escaping, uh, before it destroyed his life and marriage. Um, and those are fascinating. But the one that dropped this week is with Brian Sanchez, who is the head of our repair department. Oh, it is yeah. frippin' hysterical, okay? <laughs> Just tune into it and be really amused for an hour 20. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that right now so I can listen Good. to it later. Oh, God, yeah. Um, and then the fat guy here will be doing next week's, but most of those stories already. Uh, <laughs> So getting back to, you know, Rivendell is a brand that had influence far beyond any actual numbers it ever did. And then you had the Seattle Axis, which Yak Works was part of. Mm -hmm. But another huge part of that was early winters. Yep. And we could get into that because they ripped off some of my stuff early on and had a great eye for it. So we actually took validation from the fact they ripped off some of our stuff. Right. And right. later on, we were working with Larry and Z-Man and stuff because they had a great marketing head. And that whole thing worked great. Um, there were one or two stories there like, they had an excellent tent, the Omnipotent, which was mm -hmm. arguably the first Gore-Tex tent. And it was an awesome tent. How awesome? Well, not awesome enough to sell for $700 in 1978, I'll tell you that. And they had these ads in Backpacker magazine, you know, the, the ones that they were half a page high, one column wide. They had a little tiny coupon with little tiny lines for writing your name and your address and a little tiny uh, to get their catalog. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they made an amazing discovery. Uh, they were overbuilding things. They were in uh, Fleepin' Seattle. They were able to get titanium rod from Boeing on mm -hmm. overrun stock. And they had a machinist who understood how to bend titanium. And they ended up coming up with titanium rod tent pegs. Hmm. I mean, just simple rod tent pegs, but titanium, lighter than aluminum, much stronger, didn't just bend over. Plus, they said titanium. Right. Uh, and the first time they put one of these little ads, not for the tent, but for the tent pegs in Backpacker, holy crap, they sold several thousand dollars worth. Mm. Whereas they might sell one tent out of one of those ads. And then the light went on over their head. We're not in the tent business. We're in the selling things that people want business. Yep. And then they succeeded a great deal until the fateful time when they went from their very large mailing list they had actually developed and were succeeding with to an insane extent and buying commercial mailing lists and assuming they would succeed to the same extent. And uh, that, was, that was the beginning of the end for a very successful company. Hmm. Different story, different set of dynamics. No, I did. I did an interview with uh, Bruce Johnson, who's uh, runs this History of Gear project, and he's mm -hmm. been documenting the history of brands for a long time. And I did an interview with him, and we talked about the history of early winters. And I've been talking with a couple of their key people, and we're hoping to get them on to talk about the story as well one one day. But that was one thing Bruce talked a lot about: is their marketing savvy and their ability to sell all these accessories, that right? That was what stuff. it was entirely about. Yep. You know, it's much easier to get someone to spend twenty four ninety five than to spend $700. Right. Bruce, Bruce talks about the, the cheese knife is that <laughs> he has, he has the early winter's cheese knife and, yes. um, you know, kites and, you know, all sorts of different things, but, but that, yeah, that we did an episode on that. That one um, should be coming out here yeah. shortly. But And, and the, the most key thing about early winters was the copywriting. Mm -hmm. It's the story. Yeah, I, for, I, for, I forget the name. Peterman. Yeah, they were. There's Ron Zimmerman oh, was 
was one of those that was yeah. kind of their marketing guy, right? Yeah. I mean, there was a larger thing mm -hmm. in the outside world called Jay Peterman that existed entirely upon the copywriting, taking you to the Kasbah mm -hmm. or, or wherever. And uh, early winters was the outdoor hippie freak version of that. Mm. And they were freaks, let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've, they've been a fun brand to dive into. Their catalogs are, are, are fun to look at just because of, you know, you don't know what you're going to get when you turn the page, right? What, what type oh, of yeah. item will, will pop up. So those are, oh, we've yeah. oh man, we got alpaca for you. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those have been fun, fun to dive into. Um, Where got, were we? Yeah, no, that's, I'm kind of trying to backtrack. A, a Are we going kind of back a, to China or, uh, conquering the production world or? <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you a personal, another personal question. What was Ooh. the first product that you made that you saw out in the wild? Not something that you sold to someone you knew, but do you remember the moment that you sold a product and you went, or you just saw this item out and someone using it? Do you have any memory of that? We were selling to a large degree in Bozeman. So I got to see a fair amount of my stuff in the wild. And I was not shy about introducing myself and asking people how it was working. And no, I wasn't telling them it was so cool. I was asking them how it was working. Right. But to answer your question there, and this happened long before that stuff happened with early winters. Well, no, early winters happened, but when I was first doing the Mojo System camera bags about a year in, I, uh, you know, I got the photography magazines because it was an entire different business. And through non-compete, I was precluded from doing anything in the outdoor world that was PAX. Uh, I was uh, fairly obviously doing... Uh, camera bags and such in the outdoor world but we also had the photography world and I'm paging through a British photography magazine and there's a huge announcement about a camera bag outfit that got the red dot award and the red dot award is it's to this day a major design award in England it's mm -hmm. a big fleep and deal and the camera bag line that got the award was a stitch for stitch knockoff of my mojo modular stuff. Hmm. And, you know, maybe I should have been pissed, but A, we weren't selling in England, and B, my stuff got a major award. Hmm. And deservedly so, actually. It was pretty cool, cooler than anything I had done at Clutterworks. And that was a real, you know, holy crap, we're the real thing. We're, we're competing at a high level with everybody out there. And that was a really interesting moment. Um, did I then try and do anything about it? No, they were messing around in England and they had their own problems, et cetera. But holy crap, a Red Dot Award, wow. Right. Yeah, I was never the sort to go, oh, that's mine. You know, if you're selling the stuff, and you're making a living off of it, that's actually enough. Right. You, you mentioned while at Clutterworks and Mojo, some relationship with, with Marmot. Um, what, what, where, well, when did that all, relationship start? I think I start? also mentioned the statute of limitations. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's passed. Okay. Um, we have had an on and off relationship with Marmot literally through 40 some years um, and it's kind of karmic. Um, initially, you got time for a long, boring story? Oh, sure. Get How much time do you minutes. have? Um, I got another hour beyond I, 11. I do too, so that's fine. Okay, um, they're, they're, we may need a bio break along here, but. That's fine. Uh, Clutterworks, I started up, we built some cool stuff. We didn't really know how to sell it because we, I was selling wholesale to shops, but we weren't really building it in a way where we were looking at building a lot of stuff and turning out production runs. I was doing a lot of design work, um, 
like for early winters during this time, I ended up coming up with what was essentially a copy of a Greek fisherman's hat with a leather band, a bill, and first generation Gore-Tex. And it was actually kind of a gear pun because first generation Gore-Tex breathed great, was extremely waterproof, but would be contaminated by body oil or hair oil almost immediately and then plugged up. And uh, it wasn't until Gore started putting a layer of finely dispersed polyurethane in there that made it so it wouldn't soak up oil. This was in the banana equipment days. Mm. Uh, and kids, all I can say is that's weird cult stuff. Um, you know, they were definitely uh, making things up because nobody knew what the hell they were doing at the time. You're, you're speaking of banana? Yeah. <laughs> they're they're one that they've been on my radar. I actually got in touch with one of the founders. I need to follow up with her about about having cool. a conversation. So, oh, it, it, it was major stuff. It was the main line of Gore-Tex shells you could buy at the time. Mm. Period. Wow. Yeah, uh, you know, Marmot was Marmot was a little bit of smoke, and what kind of smoke we might talk about in a few minutes. Right. Uh, Let's get into the smoke. Okay. Um, basically, Clutterworks had been growing, and you could gauge its growth by where it was. Started out in a garage on Wallace Avenue in Bozeman, Montana. Pretty immediately moved after the first six months into an eight by forty-two foot Forest Service surplus trailer. You know, the long oval kind that are actually becoming a little fashionable now. Mm. Anyway, it was a 1950s travel trailer. Mm. Fortunately, at the time, most of the fabric you could get was 45 inches wide, not 60 inches wide. So we were able to build a cutting table in there up against one wall that we could use. My friend Darvin spent most of the eight months we worked out of that place sleeping under the cutting table. Uh, and uh, I was still renting a house, thank goodness. And uh, we went from that. And uh, it was at the end of that we had early winters start sniping a couple of the things we sold. To which we actually ended up becoming their supplier for a few things. Um, and we moved downtown and we got a, 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 a office space up above what is currently our dealer in town, which is uh, called Schnee's. And they have this truly bizarre lightning bolt and target looking sign that was right outside our window of the time. That's when I first got, I got my first bar tacker. And then we got to move down onto Main Street. We were on Main Street before, but you know, upstairs. And that's when we got a storefront. And for aficionados who want to do the Bozeman tour, it was the west half of the Mackenzie River pizza shop now. Uh, <laughs> and you'll see pictures of us in a shop with a bright outside window and a long cutting table. It's in some of the uh, stuff we have uh, on the website. That was that shop. And it was in that shop where September of 79? No, 78. No, 77. I mean, it's a lot of years ago. What can I tell you? 77. Um, that we had packs up on the wall. We had CODs for nylon coming in, but I had delivered everything that had been ordered through the summer and we had no actual business going on. And might as well tell the whole story. I uh, had nothing going on. I had no longer being a sales rep and I went, well, I guess I'll take some construction work. Mm -hmm. And I got on 
and uh, the first two days I was doing this, we were in the uh, building, the basement of another Bozeman landmark, the Lewis and Clark Hotel. Uh, put that on your bingo card for when you visit Bozeman. Uh, saunas, they have saunas. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I spent some time underneath a elevator sump, which uh, if you don't know what that is, it's about three times the size of a concrete casket uh, uh, burial thing that they had uh, jackhammered a hole into for a sump pump because it said it was a sump. And uh, no, it was supposed to be waterproof. So there I was underneath it, tarring it getting tar coming down on me like crazy as a suspended, slowly spinning with a crane. And I'm going, yeah, it would be a bad thing if that dropped. Um, and then I ended up spending the last uh, day and a half of my construction career standing on top of a pile of hot asphalt, hand raking it out for an apartment parking lot that was too small to bring in real paving machinery mm -hmm. then i was discovering when you showered the night after that you could be blowing hot asphalt oil out your nose for a half hour and the next day standing on top of the pile of asphalt i remember very think clearly having another turning point in my life which was honest labor is not for me and so I quit, thank God. And then uh, we went and tried to figure out what to do. And what to do would be, we've got to start selling these packs wholesale to someone else because I've sold a ton of them in town and I'll probably sell more, but I got to sell some now. And so we took the VW bug, my wife and I, and we had a pair of Malamutes and their family, so they had to come too. And this was September, they're starting to shed. So we had the shopping bags that the stuff that she would comb out of the dogs, we would put into shopping bags. And by the way, we also had the gear we were going to show in the dogs with the Malamute shedding. <laughs> then we went down through Jackson and didn't sell any packs. And then we went down through Casper and didn't sell any packs. We went down through Cheyenne. I mean, we're just driving on in the bug. Didn't sell any fricking packs. Went down to Fort Collins to the Hollya Bar store. They liked the stuff, but they had a new guy who owned it and he wasn't gonna take the chance on it. His name was Jim Cack. His name will come up at some other time. Um, wonderful guy. Uh, didn't sell any packs. Didn't sell any packs in Denver. Didn't sell any packs in Colorado Springs. I mean, people would go, oh, it looks interesting, but, you know, nobody's asking for it. And so we're a little down, let me tell you. So I cut over to, you know, we, we, we had heard about some crazy people who had waterproof down sleeping bags. Now I had already built some waterproof synthetic sleeping bags and we knew that the synthetic at least would keep you alive in a very uncomfortable manner. A down bag, that's, that's crazy talk. And so we drove over to Grand Junction where we went, marmots, huh? I thought they were rats. Anyway, uh, we went in and showed the terraplane the Clutterworks terraplane. We had the other stuff and the hip sacks as well. And they looked at it and they stuffed a sleeping bag, one of the waterproof ones in while explaining what Gore-Tex was. And uh, holy crap, we clicked, we clicked hard. Mm. And I left them the terraplane and they fronted me a bag that was $300 at the time, which was, you know, holy, holy moly. Um, and we drove back to Bozeman. We had an order for two dozen terraplanes and that kept us going. They put the terraplanes in their catalog. The first two or three years, it was in a white paper insert in the middle of the Marmot catalog. And uh, 
they were our main wholesale account and we got along well it was what my year, second year. what year would that have been this would have been like 77 okay and uh you know because all of us were you know if you're going to do something you just do it there were no seasons uh or there no planning seasons in advance holy crap they started selling our packs and selling a fair amount of them both uh, on paper there was no web uh, <laughs> I mean, there was hardly even an ARPANET at that time. Right. Um, and so, cool. And after I got out of Clutterworks, they sold the packs for a while, but they sold my camera bags. Again, in the middle insert in their catalogs. Hmm. We got along really well. Now, we're all pack of hippies. They're the folk that introduced me to the notion that no, this stuff is from Hawaii. And you see how it's really pretty. It's not dirt in a bag. And oh, yeah. And it's $100 a quarter. And it was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, so we all evolved along. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it was just a part of the culture at the time both there and admittedly at the works. Um, so we were selling them camera bags through the whole mojo cycle. And this then ties back to, you know, after Clutterworks went out of business the second time, I sort of went, you know, there's no one to really enforce a non-compete anymore. I think I'll, you know, I got some cool materials. We had high density polyethylene plastic that we were using as an impact protection layer in some bigger camera bags that instead of like using EVA foam or something, usually a cheaper closed cell foam, we were using the plastic as an outer and then a much softer inner foam, which gave us much better protection dynamics. That turned out to be what frame sheets are made out of. Um, and no one was doing frame sheets at that time. It had never been seen. Um, we had started using sailing battens that I had discovered in some marine catalogs, uh, the kind of uh, small fiberglass uh, extrusion that would be used to stiffen a sailboat sails for certain kinds of racing. Mm. And we were pretty good and advanced on buckles and webbing already and on fabrics. We were, uh, with this new stuff, we were the first people to use 500 denier Kadura at all when it came out because everybody was still convinced that people were after Kadura for heavy burly protection. Mind you, 1,000 denier Kadura was not woven very tightly at the time. And in terms of waterproofness, it uh, sucked. Uh, 500 wove much tighter. The coating would work better. And uh, it was a cool thing. Um, so we, using 500 Denier Kadura, uh, started looking hard at how we would build a new complete take on packs. And, Go from going from frameless packs to a pack working with a frame, you know, we needed to be able to control the entire width of the body panel against you. And up to this time, the low boys, everybody else, Gregory, were essentially using two unconnected aluminum strips, which, you know, gave you some top to bottom uh, uh, load channeling but didn't really control the shape of the pack. Internal frames of the time, you had to pack very carefully to make the load be the shape of your back. And we wanted something with a little more, a little more positive body. And so I stuck a piece of plastic in, and plastic is plastic, but if you stiffen it in one direction, like with perhaps one stay instead of two, so you can save some weight and not have it be net any heavier. We were then able to put the S shape of your back into the back of the pack, 
Initially, we were using 30 thousandths plastic and sewing the little light sailing battens across to make sure it didn't flex crosswise. But then we found net we were better off going to 60 thousandths plastic and then just sewing a single stay, you know, a, a piece of webbing in to hold a single one inch stay. We played with all sorts of shapes. For a while there, we were using 3 16 thick by 3 quarter wide, uh, which was stiff enough and saved us some weight over doing two stays but uh, tended to be actually too stiff and would tend to crack the plastic. So we went back to one inch. And then we discovered instead of, whoa, 6061 aircraft alloy, 2024, which is twice as expensive, but 2024 actually held its shape while being sprung uh, much, much better than 6061. So that's what we use to this day. Um, still more expensive, that's life, it's the right gear. And so we came up with a line of packs that were absolutely unique at the time, built it in men's and women's, and I presented it to my business partners. Yes, I had some more business partners, people who were our distribution into the photographic world, mm. and they had about 40% of the company. Um, and it was part of how we'd been able to grow the company into, you know, a million dollar plus company and, uh, working with, uh, an extended dealer base in the photographic world. And when we showed them this great stuff, and this was great stuff, especially for the time they went, uh, eh, eh, man, the, n nobody goes backpacking. That's a dying business. Uh, by the way, their major business was darkroom chemicals. Savor the irony. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I learned lots from them. We ended up parting on good terms, but we did end up parting. However, they just, there was zero support. And, you know, they forbade us to spend money to try and get into that business. So there I was with a finished up line and we had a relationship with the Marmots. So I went down there and showed them the line and they went cool because at the time they had tents, sleeping bags, outerwear, uh, you know, and uh, no pack. Mm. And, you know, they said, okay, but you know, this needs to, you know, we've got things we could patent here. And you'll have to license it to us exclusively, which I did. They paid for the patenting. That was my first patent ever. And it was pretty educational. And uh, basically for two full years, they were selling the Marmot Mountain Works packs and doing a pretty good job of it. Uh, now, that was started up in 83. And this is in their catalogs of the time as Marmot Mountain Works gear. There was no mention of... Dana or this or that. I had no real public name at the time. Um, and uh, it was this pure private label job. The second year out, they wanted to get cheaper and, you know, hey, we should be talking with this guy or that guy about getting it built. And I go, well, what do we get paid? And they go, well, we actually own it. Well, thanks, guys. Um, but we were still building them. It was looking to be a difficult negotiation coming up for the 85, you know, for the 86 season in 85. And, uh, man, they were, they were on a roll. And they had just built their own building in Grand Junction on Marmot Lane. And, uh, you know, things were to the outside looking pretty cool. And in... Uh, June or so of 85, I get a phone call. And it's Eric Reynolds. And Eric uh, just gives me the quick and hard, you know, this, this is difficult, uh, but we're going to have to drop the packs. And I go, what? You sold 3,000 of them so far. And, you know, it's, I mean, what happened? 
And he said, don't feel bad. We're dropping the tents too. Hmm. And they had a freaking awesome best there ever was Gore-Tex tent called the Taku tent. That was a big part of their identity. They loved it. So I knew it wasn't just the whole pack thing. Something was something weird had happened. But I went, okay, because they they were doing it quick and hard and ripping off the Band-Aid. And they did. Good for them. So that summer, and I could get into what was going on in the photo business. And we were needing to spread out. We were building some of the first computer bags. We were uh, doing some of our first military stuff, packing ele- packaging electronics for the field. Um, we ended up doing what's called a camera Barney, a heated cover for a TV news camera that was hauled up to do the first televised summit of Everest by ABC. Light world of sports. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we were figuring out how to heat this thing and, you know, getting into the world of electric uh, heating panels and stuff. And just fascinating problems, but not big numbers, but they keep the business going. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole photographic business was evolving and it wasn't the happy hunting ground that it used to be. So I go, cool, I'm going to be back in the pack business. Um, and we actually end up negotiating the separation of the photographic uh, partners and Dana does, and, and what was called Mojo at the time. <laughs> and it is in August of 1985 where I come up with, and we're going to call it Dana Design. <laughs> By the way, make note of that. It isn't Dana Designs. It's Dana Design. Noted. Picky, picky, picky. Uh, And uh, we could have taken the Marmot packs and just slapped our label on it. But we'd had two years of lessons. And I went through an entire rethink. And this is when we came up with the basic structure of the ArcFlex packs which are the main thing that we did with Dana Design for Big Pack Design. Had everything doing it sized, doing it with the curved uh, stays on the side. Um, We had everything but the molded waist belt. And uh, there's some funny stories there. Um, Yeah, I ended up... uh, having a couple of little weasel design kids, you know, yank my chain down at the old marmot store in Berkeley over a couple of things. And that caused me to get into a development cycle and come up with the molded waist belts. Uh, Mike, uh, oh God, what's his name? That he's, he's, he's doing the uh, titanium uh, poop scoops these days. God, he's been a contract designer forever. Mike, yeah, see Alzheimer's. <coughs> In any case, uh, at that time, he was a really annoying 18-year-old kid uh, working at the Marmot stores. It's the, it, the folk that you get along with, the folk that tell you they love your stuff, those people, they never help you actually improve things it's the freaking (laughs) annoying little (laughs) and thank god for them but man it's tough to like them (laughs) so in any case that was the birth of dana design but what it also was was you know i was telling you about what actually happened to the marmots was 85 was the time when bill came for them. They had been growing, but they'd been having cash flow problems. The bank was not amused. Mm. They had uh, spent a lot of money getting their new 20,000 foot headquarters and plant built. And the bank called their note. And the folks at Odyssey had been building their gear. And so Bill had a uh, pretty well-practiced suggestion by that point, which is 
I'll assume your debt mm -hmm. and we will give you help in uh, management, but you're going to have to concentrate on the stuff that we build. And they didn't build packs and they didn't really build tents. So you're going to have to drop your tent line and your pack line. So they had no problem dropping the pack line. They were pretty twisted and torn about the tent line because that was something they were invested in and it was beautiful mm -hmm. and this is when I started getting the story about you know who actually owns the North Face and Sierra Designs and 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 oh and they own Marmot now oh really and part of this comes from one of the things you learn when you are in business for a long period of time is don't burn bridges too badly. Uh, when we started getting Dana going, um, a name that uh, has showed up a couple of times, Marty Stilling. Ah, Marty was uh, living up in the Northeast and he was no longer sales managing and he had been a fixture in black ice, something that came out of when the brothers at World Leaders Experience split. By the way, family, doing a family business is always harder than working with strangers. And I'm doing a family business now, but it is. It, it is. You better have some key core reasons to do it and family, it better matter. Black ice come up on your uh, radar at all? You know, we've got a couple of their catalogs. Um, haven't haven't talked to anyone from there. Or who yeah, was part it's of it. basically coming out of the not quite dead ashes of wilderness experience. Yeah, yeah. We I haven't really gotten into black. Well, you know, we I talked to Jim and Greg Thompson a little bit, and Black Ice came up a little, but we didn't we didn't talk too much about it. Yeah, it's, that wasn't a glory time for them, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I believe that was one of them. Yeah. And they were pissed at each other at the time. Mm -hmm. um, basically, Wilderness Experience was the very first outdoor company to go public. Mm -hmm. But uh, when they came to a break in the ways, it was vicious. It was bad. It was destructive. Mm. And that's life. Yeah, let me oh, just finish off that. Oh, sure. That okay. Marty Stilling thing. Yeah. He yeah. became my rep in the Northeast. Okay. Whereas he had been my sales manager and ended up giving me a raw deal when I quit on a few years later. Hey, here we are again. And I'm, and, and working with a number of people I had worked with in either worked for or worked with in some manner. And the fact of the matter is, is, uh, a whole lot I know about the Odyssey thing and how the companies went on has been from pumping folk who worked there or new people who worked there and talking with them and doing long, long drives across the country with them and getting them to tell the story three times so I could see how the story changed each time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Of course, they got my stories too, God help them. Yeah. Uh, Okay, go ahead, direct. Yeah, so on uh, on tying your name to a company, what what was your thought behind that? Did you have any reservations of that? And what was uh, my I mean, that's thought? a that's a big that's a big. <laughs> that was my thought. Yeah, uh, it's a big you know, step. I mean, you're you're putting your reputation. Out some good stuff. Yeah, and but really much more than pounding my chest personally, it was just a good name. It's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. So but, that was why we did it. Right. So yeah, maybe touch on some of the high points um, and some of the low points, uh, you know, the company incorporating in 87, right. And, and formally uh, and getting actually, going. Pretty much forming in 85. Okay. 85. So the fall of 85, we still produced camera bags. Okay. But we had come to a amicable parting of the ways because frankly, Camera bags at the time had transitioned from being a really high value added item um, to eh, it's more a commodity mm. and needed to be built. Uh, let's see, they went to Costa Rica first and it was fine. Our blessing, go. We're, we're in the outdoor business. 
we actually still did a lot of computer bags. We did video bags for, uh, what was it, Piggly Wiggly. They were renting VHS players and, you know, like you'd rent the player and three tapes, take it home to the trailer and, uh, you know, play them and stuff. And they do it in our bag. And we were shameless. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we were getting the can the the pack thing to go. Now you're going Dana Design. Man, that must have gone like a rocket. Well, at one point it did, but in 1986, in fall of '85, I take it to the local outdoor store. A couple of them, really good ones. One called Northern Lights here, that later on became a really good company for us. But at that time, I brought them what was 95% the terraplane. And they were, you know, it looks good, but you're here. And if you're up here, it can't be anything special. I mean, I'm dead serious. I was getting this from the Montana Mafia, the shops that are around here. And A, no one's really asking for it. Well, of course they're not asking for it. It is, you know... And, and one or two people said, could you do those marmot packs again? These are much better. No, yeah, but people know those. And, you know, basically, once you start making it somewhere else, we'll be glad to start selling it. But, you know, you're from around here. It can't be that special. <clears throat> yes, that's, that's the uh, story of Dana, who is uh, god of the business. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. Um, so, okay. I go down to a rep show in California. Um, you know, they have regional rep shows. And uh, I try and hire a rep. And, you know, I'm showing the stuff in detail. And nobody is actually any good at it, has interest. I ended up with a guy who mostly was a pretty good tennis rep. But, hey, some of these shops also sell backpacks. So, you know, towards the end of my visit, I'll show them packs. He didn't end up selling anything in a full season. We came to a mutual parting of the ways. Um, I end up talking to another guy. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he gives it a try. He's an outdoor rep, at least, but he's terrible. Ugh. And again, this was the stuff that comes out of the bag at the very end of a visit not, hey, check this out. Um, and again, nothing, not a zip. And I talked to a third guy who gets the samples and is never heard from again. He pawned them or something. Um, and it's at that point, a full year later that I go, oh, crap. Well, I'm not going to run production for this other stuff, but Renee can do that, and she certainly can. It's far better than me at that. Um, I, I was designing a lot of these OEM projects that we were surviving on. And uh, so I'm going to do it. And I had been a rep 15 years before. God, it's getting old already. Uh, <laughs> and so I go down and I'm not part of the rep groups. So I'm not at the local trade shows. I'm just going direct to the shops and the ownership of the shops is fully, well, yeah, it looks good, but you know, nobody's asking for it. But then I make a change in my approach, which is not to, do serious life or death meetings with the ownership or the buyers. Let's go in, talk with the employees, get them to go out in a weekend with me. Um, and essentially, uh, also at the time, you know, nowadays, uh, employee discounts, professional discounts, that kind of thing is a total way of life. Back then in the late 80s and early 90s, you only gave that kind of a discount to people who were already working at a shop that you were going with, and it was grudgingly given. 
Whereas I turned around and went, no, I'll give you a 10% under wholesale, no problem, right away. And I started selling packs to people who were actually using the packs and working at stores. And I did that for a full season. And you know what? I started getting some shops the following season into the fall going, yeah, you know, Joe loved your stuff and it's, and okay, we'll try some. And the thing is, in most of these shops, it actually got down to, I already had half the people at the shop using my packs. And this is why I build packs. You can really tell if there's a difference. And we really had a difference. And especially if you're feeling it at the end of the day. You know, you can make anything feel feel pretty good uh, when it's stuffed with pillows or, uh, you know, a few pounds of whatever at the shop. Basically, at every one of these shops where I had seated employees and they were using it and liking it, when it got turned on as something that they would sell, they sold nothing but the stuff they were using and liked. Mm -hmm. And literally... Within a year and a half of me starting doing this in California, I was able to talk to the two best reps in California and friends to this day. And uh, one took it and rolled with it. Now, I could have taken the lesson from this that, no, I can develop it or we can do this stuff in-house. But fact of the matter is, I was surfing everybody's couches <laughs> and uh, I mean, I was just one of the guys and uh, I think that was appreciated as well. It kicked off big in California. Fortunately enough, <clears throat> I ran into really smart and hard user who had just become a sales rep up in the Northwest, Maury Troutman who had been guiding on McKinley a couple of years and uh, had a degree in accounting and was an incredibly smart guy. And he saw the potential. He went with it. I didn't have to, I traveled with him a fair amount, but I didn't have to break in the Northwest. So then I go to the Rockies and, you know, the, the Northern Rockies down through uh, Southern Rockies and, yeah, okay. I, I get the Montana guys and, hey, we've been hearing about you. <laughs> and it goes right in and starts selling. And the thing is, for the next few years, I handled two rep repertori- territories per year, doing two to three trips per year in each one and building out the entire dealer base for Dana Design. Uh, including some going up to Alaska with Maury, uh, including some Canadian stuff. And it is one of the most privileged times of my life to have uh, swept across the country, met everybody, interacted with everybody, cruised everybody's couches. (laughs) And, uh, The very last territory was the Southeast. Now I'm originally from Massachusetts and I saw Deliverance in a drive-in movie theater and it was a scary, scary movie. Um, And uh, probably a couple of generations that don't know that one, but uh, you know, let's just say it didn't paint the South in the the, uh, best of lights. And I ended up doing the South the very last and you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried. And I fell through a freaking open door because there's such nice people doing a lot of outdoor stuff. And, uh, you know, we ended up uh, developing some relationships that uh, go on to this time. And again, this is one of the privileges of my life to do this across the whole country. But it also helped a very great deal to cement us in uh, our dealers' minds as some an outfit that's a little bit different. Um, long about 88 and 89, 89, I'm off the road. And we have 
one of the two or three best reps in every territory. And I would have essentially de facto, not just the designer, but the sales manager. Now, in most companies, the sales manager has a very discreet role. They've been probably brought in to do it. They're quote professionals. I was nowhere near that smart. So we did it in a collegial manner, not with everybody, but I always had three to four of the folk, uh, more than just guys who were the folk that we would pull together and plan with and have exquisite knowledge of what was going on on the ground in a business sense, in addition to simply having serious relationships with lots and lots of people using the gear hard. And this is a key difference with my companies. We seek out the people who are abusive, who burn gear up, who are doing ridiculous things with it, and we make the stuff so it works for them. Right. And uh, it's a huge strength to the company. Well, and I mentioned and some of that. Oh, I was just going to say, just with you traveling the country, you talking to people, I think, you know, you were on your third company. Um, you could have easily just said, well, I'm the designer. I don't do that. You know, it's like you can't afford <laughs> not to do that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't afford not to do that and, and go out and sell the product and talk to Terrible people. Terrible little feedback. secret. I'm, a f I'm known as a designer. And mm -hmm. you know what? I got some decent chops as a designer. I, I can do it really well. But at heart, deep down, I'm a frustrated sales guy, man. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the sales side of it is in no way. I mean, some people sniff at it. Oh, they're just, you know, they're just salespeople. It's an art and it is something that is, should have some honor, especially if the money that is being paid to you comes because people have been able to sell this stuff. Um, design is a key thing as well. But when I meet people, oh man, there was a long period where it wasn't designers, it was meeting inventors. And they uniformly were, oh, if this thing will sell itself. And, uh, you know, this is just what people are waiting for. And, you know, they just, no. Once you have the best, once you have an exquisite piece that does what it should be designed to do, congratulations. You have the utterly essential first 20% of what you need to do to turn it into a continuing business that will be significant, not just for you, not just for your company, but significant for the people who actually use your gear. And that is who we are ultimately responsible to. Mm -hmm. I've been in companies where we've been responsible to the shareholders. Um, let me tell you, one of the best pieces of advice I can give someone who is in a corporate uh, environment is as soon as someone says, we're here to increase shareholder value, you either shoot or you run because things aren't going to end well. Right. Because then it's not, it's not about the, the user anymore. It's not about the product. Yeah. Yeah. It's just about return to a, this vague image. Right. And that is not a, uh, that is not a higher responsibility for me or the people I work with. I mean, you got to make money. There's no question about that, but that isn't the very first thing we think about when we're trying to, uh, serve another group of people. Right. Well, with that said, should we dive into your time in, in the corporate world, this transition, Dana be, be being acquired? <laughs> Sure. So yeah, what I mean, what led to some of that decision? And again, it goes back to the name of the company, Dana. How you know you get this opportunity to sell the company? How does that feel selling your something that has your name on it? 
Well, I mean, we were all for doing it and for a reason that might not be fully appreciated. Renee and I, in the first half year that uh, Dana Design existed, we did $70,000. Not in the first month, the first six months. And yeah, we survived. And the following, yeah, we probably we did, you know, close to a million bucks in the year. Close. Well, maybe 700,000. And as we grew, we had to keep changing how we did business internally. You do not you do not get 10 times bigger by adding 10 times the number of people. And you have to change what you're doing. And in our case, we had to change what we were doing while still maintaining respect for the users, respect for the people who were building this stuff, and respect for ourselves. And you know what? There are times when there are decisions that are hard, but you have to do it. And, you know, basically uh, the maintaining respect for not just the customers, but for our workers and for ourselves, we, I mean, it was a long and interesting path going from 1985 to 1995. And the company was getting bigger and financing things was not getting easier, even though we were making good money and paying every debt and paying no banks, et cetera. Um, and we were also becoming aware that there were other things to running a successful business and that it might be difficult for us to pick that up on our own as we ran along. And we had had one group already approach us, which was the people who, uh, how should I phrase this, ruined Moonstone Mountaineering. It ended up getting sold along a chain of like three or four people into utter irrelevance. Right, and I think I think Columbia Sportswear owns the, owns the rights to it now, from what I understand. But yeah, I've yeah. talked to Fred a little bit. Fred's on my list. I'm hoping to get him on. Soon. Oh yeah, oh man, Fred, Fred is the guy who came tootling along in a VW van when we were at Clutterworks, and pulled out. Hey, look at this synthetic bag and. Hey, man, cool. That's really good. And so, you know, we weren't really in the resale business, but we knew Fred. Fred knew us, et cetera. And uh, Fred ruled that category for uh, a number of years. He's awesome stuff. We we did a whole episode um, about the Arcada California companies. Oh, yeah. And we talked Yakima, with um, Fred. Yeah, um, down the, home the, uh, wetsuit people down home. Yeah, yeah, Kokatat. Um, yeah, I t- we talked to Chuck. Um, it's Chuck and Denise who started um, down home, and we we recorded their history and just kind of talked about that region mm-hmm. and kind of how how odd it was that this small town you know had so many outdoor companies pop up around the same time. And a lot of that goes back to Chuck and Denise, these two starting a, a retail store in the area. So that was a fun conversation, which we need to plug Fred into soon. Oh yeah. Uh, I would love, I'd love the chance to, uh, guess with him a while. Yeah. Yeah. And then he got into doing an entirely different thing, software. Hmm. Yeah. I'll, I, I'm hoping to cover that. I know we're going to talk. It sounds like in the coming months, he, he wants cool. to share the story. So, so well, Dana said, hi. Yeah. I, I'll, <laughs> I'll mention that. Um, so, yeah, just continue anyway, down getting the, back yeah. to this thing. Yeah, we ended up with an approach from an outfit that was at the time called Anthony Industries. Right. And this became K2, right? Yeah, they owned K2 skis. Mm. And Anthony Industries, uh, the senior Anthony, uh, it started out as Anthony Pools, and they were doing in-ground pools in the L.A. area. Hmm. But uh, smart guy, built a learning organization, acquired some interesting companies, uh, Shakespeare Fishing, 
um, um, Stearns, uh, which was on the water sports and hunting world side of things and was an incredibly well-run company um, and a number of others. And they had K2. And uh, we talked and the philosophy of the company at the time was that we all have things to learn. We can learn from each other. We could borrow uh, the management uh, people uh, from some of the other companies or go to them to learn. And uh, excellence was a real factor. And uh, he was great. And uh, we felt that this would allow us to grow. And we had a pretty good uh, uh, earn out. And we got, you know, it was, it was impressed that you should get enough money the first bite at the apple to keep you satisfied because you might never get anything more. And uh, they were also undergoing some changes in how they were managing because he was in his 80s. And so he became chairman of the board. And about a month after, and this was six months or so into we had sold and we were working with them. And oh, by the way, we had a plan. We needed to bring out a lower price line of stuff than Dana Design. So they bought the smoking hulk of wilderness experience. And, uh, you know, we were going to uh, make that go as a lower priced, more broadly distributed thing. And we were going to get uh, some help from them, be able to run this whole thing ourselves. And then he kicked. And then about two and a half weeks later, the CFO of the company ascends to become the CEO. And he has a little different message for everybody. Yes. Uh, our highest responsibility as a company is to the shareholders and that we must improve shareholder value. So give us your quarterly projections. You better have 25% growth in there. And, 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 and it just turned into an entire different company. Uh, we ended up with a person that we were answering to who was uh, undercutting Renee and I. In 97, two years in, oh, no, no, you got to kill off all your own production. We'll have professionals outside the company do the outside production. It'll be, they're, they're professionals. It'll be great. Um, so we had to end up, uh, I ended up firing nearly 250 people. They're my people. I did it. Um, we had quite a bit of middle management that we were able to put on to essentially inspecting and instructing. Uh, but you know what, when you get a fly to Sri Lanka or for the lucky folk, La Paz, Mexico, um, you might do it for a year. You might do it for two, but you're going to get burned out and our people got burned out and we weren't building any more because we built them in our manufacturing and uh 97 is when things changed over the 98 stuff was still okay 99 not so much and things were starting to slide in a pretty big way my partner renee business partner um left in 97 soon after uh, we uh ended up having to collapse our own production, which by the way, we were netting better than 10%. I mean, there was literally no reason to do this except that everybody's doing it. The theme of just this whole conversation is, I don't know, just the evolution of the industry, right? M moving towards, I, I think oh, yeah. we're kind of in a time, right? Right now where there's corporatization, but there's also brands like Mystery Ranch that are thriving on their own, you know? Um, yep. So it's, there's definitely a push, push pull. And it seems like right now the industry is kind of being pulled in two different directions, right? There's a push to well, corporatization. I, and, and I have to, to tell you, as you grow, 
everything about how U.S. business is constructed, the banking system, et cetera, is designed to push you towards selling to something bigger or selling to private equity so they can then sell to something bigger because that's entirely what they're based upon. And you know what? I could have pushed this thing towards just building it up to get the biggest payday possible. But you know what? Renee and I have been there and we have the bloody infected tattoos that still are freaking painful. And we aren't, uh, we're not looking for that. But that being said, the U.S. banking system um, sucks and is not constructed to work with companies that are building a bunch of what they're doing outside and then bringing it in. They're really not built to work with companies that build in Asia and then sell across the world. And so as you get bigger, the need to sell becomes more and more. And you have to have some serious experience and you have to have a serious attitude to, invo uh, to avoid it. In our case, we're not just an outdoor company. We're not just a wholesale to retail company. We do 20% of our business over the web direct. We do a full 40% of our business internationally. I do a full just under 50% of my business with what we call the mission side, which is military and firefighting and an entire different group of people than any other company uh, in the space works with. And it gives us, well, diversity, uh, business diversity. Um, we're doing uh, work in diversity a number of other different ways. Um, it's let us work right through this year and turn it into the biggest year we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Although in terms of planning, we actually uh, in March cut back our goals, which we have exceeded. Uh, we cut back our goals by 15%. And uh, then we just continued to mow on and do the best we can. That we did masks. Mask turned into nearly a million dollars of business, and that's with us giving 20% of them away. Wow. Um, and we built an awesome mask. Um, and that was entirely started because our local hospital didn't have any. As I get older, some of the things you do cut close to home. But we managed to do very well by doing good as well. And uh, it's one of the pleasures of my life. It seems like a lot of people in this business, you can cut corners and just make more stuff, but that doesn't seem like anything you've been driven by. It's always been about doing stuff that matters and masks, especially in the climate that we're in now. That's like the epitome of doing something that really yeah. matters and va is, has, has value and protects people. Um, but it seems to be a theme, you know, that's, that's driven you is making stuff that really matters to people and makes a difference. And a mask is kind of the epitome, epitome of that in, in the environment that we're living in. Yep. That's one of them. Um, you know, is it just, I wish I could tell you I was, you know, a marketing genius, uh, but uh, we tend to try and find people who need what we do. Right. And uh, in some other cases, that means we have to adapt to what we do when other meaning has to be uh, established or uh, performed. Right. Well, with the, the... By the way, we have such a great time doing this. And that goes down through 
the whole company. And you'll see some videos and such. And you know what? We have, you know, one of the sayings here that we live by is it's good to be a rancher. Mm -hmm. And it is. Right. Well, I'm sure that's something you picked up, you know, at different companies, realizing what not to do, you know, how to not build a culture, how to not, you know, how to, how to create something where hopefully people enjoy what they're doing and have fun uh, doing it. You know, I, I, a key phrase that I already uttered in that story about why I, uh, how I became unemployable, mm. not doing stupid things for stupid people that aren't going to work anyway. Um, it was uh, less than a year after that when I realized I'm making people unemployable. Yeah, God, they're going to compete with me. It's going to be awful. And that's, that's your thing. I mean, what we do is hard mm -hmm. and there is no reason to have a bad time doing it. Mm -hmm. And we tend to not create that many unemployable people. Although one of the other things that we uh, do is we have graduates. I mean, people don't work at Dana or the ranch forever. And those graduates go on to do other things and usually pretty awesome other things. And we can still maintain a relationship and quite frankly, be proud of them. And uh, that's been uh, one of the outgrowths of how this thing is run anyway. Well, we've talked a, quite a bit about Mystery Ranch throughout this whole conversation. Um, and I know we were, you know, we, we should prob probably wrap up here in, in, you know, less than 15. Um, yep. We didn't leave a lot of time for your current, um, your, your current company, um, but I think we've talked a lot about it throughout. Um, My current company, I have a weakness right now in that my current company is doing every single thing that I could possibly imagine and have imagined uh, extremely well. And therefore, unless we're going to just be fat and happy, I need more people with interesting goals. And what we do in the wildland fire world, we are I mean, we are essentially driving that for the people who work in that world right now to the point where we are also backing proposals that the people that we call wildland firefighters, they're actually uh, regarded and paid and their job is forestry technician. Mm. And, you know, when, when the video is running, they're firefighters, but when the off season comes, you're laid off, have fun. Uh, you know, you made a big bucket of money. You'll end up spending it all and then coming back and needing overtime again. Is that what you look for in, in people who you bring into the, the ranch family is people who are looking to upend and, and do something more than just make more product, right? You're, it you're looking to change it, an industry it, it, and a it, system. It's, it's not that we, you know, everybody's a rebel. No, mm -hmm. you can't really afford that many rebels. <laughs> yeah. Right. But if someone has a point of view and is valid and it needs doing, um, it's not out of the question that we will help shift that thing along. Right. It seems like the biggest difference between, um, Mystery. But we try and do things as opposed to talk about things. Right. When you see what's going on in our diversity initiatives, mm -hmm. um, it's funny when we get to the women's side of things, given that Renee Sipple Baker is one of the smartest and most effective women around. And, uh, you know, that's never been a factor at the ranch in turn. I mean, you can't do that. You're a woman. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the people being able to do the jobs is important. The great majority, I mean, I have a few people I have hired from the outside and we tend to have them work for at least a couple of weeks to a month on the floor. And the great majority of the middle management of the business up through sales managers are people who started out on our sewing floor and they know what's important. They know what's the base of the food chain. 
and that helps a very great deal at maintaining the culture throughout, especially as we grow. This is such a stark contrast from from themes we've touched on of cutting cost, you know, efficiency, sending things overseas. Um, we've done all of that. Yeah, but we have the base and customer that we are responsible for and that we in most cases worship Hmm. i don't know if you would uh, other companies would use that word i think that's an interesting way of talking about the customer right no and not a not a criticism i think that that speaks to the 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 difference right at the company Mm -hmm. Um, that treatment of of the customer and how the customer is viewed um I was going to ask this at the beginning, but I think it's interesting to ask it here at the end. But why PAX? <laughs> what is it about PAX that's kept you working on this product for so long? Because the only other piece that could make you can make the difference with is boots. Mm. And I never really got started in boots. PAX can hurt. And some of the worst experiences of my life we're using a pack that just was being used in severe conditions and it wasn't the right one for the job or a bad pack. And you get immediate feedback. And, you know, packs make the biggest difference in how you are going to feel, you know, with the possible exception of boots, of any bit of gear out there. Um, and it's just come down to PAX matter. And one of the things that is, you know, we, we explore this because it gets around to, you know, why don't we start doing clothing or other things? And I can give you some reasons and maybe we will someday, we'll see. Uh, it's not uh, particularly on the horizon uh, right now, uh, especially for the consumer world. Um, but, Gregory, it's a pack company. I mean, even within the Samsonite crew, it's a pack company. Osprey, it's a pack company. And uh, those two and us, we're the main thing. Deuter is a possible different thing. But most of the companies that are really, really flipping good at packs do packs. And we have... uh, also developed in that way. Back at Dana Design, we looked very hard and did a lot of prototyping of uh, outerwear. Mm. But uh, quite frankly, when it came around to, no, you've got to pick your colors two years in advance with no feedback. There wasn't a wheelbarrow big enough to carry the balls that takes from a business perspective. Um, So, we pulled back on it and uh, you know what? We, we still have a ways to go building packs right. and we do today, especially doing it for the different groups that we work for. Um, well, I imagine with packs, there's enough of these specialized um, just industries, careers, uh, uses um, that are not being served. Right. There's, there's enough of well, those. Well, it's not like there's to... a ton of them sitting out there. Right. And, uh, you know, strangely enough, we did pull back from the fashion side, whereas uh, we do a lot of uh, military work. And when I say military, I'm not saying, oh, it gets sold in shops. This is being right. used directly by That's military. Issue. Yeah. Um, and for the firefighters, uh, they genuinely, they need what we do and we do it very well for them. Well, it seems prior to you coming along there, they, they were being underserved, right? So there's that opportunity, right? There's an opportunity. Well, that's the odd thing. Most of the people doing fire stuff before we came along were firefighters hmm. and they had the best intentions in the world, but they had perhaps a little bit more limited tool set than we had. And they were fixated on how they wanted to do things. Whereas when we came in working with both the military and the firefighters, it's, we know how to do a certain number of things. 
how are you using this gear? Because mm -hmm. we aren't going to change their basic relationship with the gear. So we have to work within that context. Right. Um, one of the things, design, clever designers are a menace, okay? You just, here, you just have to do these simple things and it'll be so good. Listen, nobody's interested. Okay, they're going to do things the way they have conceived of doing it, and they're going to continue to do it that way. At Dana, we trained people or tried to train people on a few simple things that literally apply to everybody's packs of the time and up through very few years ago, which was loosen up the side stabilizer straps before you put the pack on, loosen up the lifters, put the pack on, fasten the belt snug the shoulder harness and then pull lifters and the uh, side stabilizers and anybody's pack will work better don't worked that way i got to spend three uh early seasons at a place called uh, mountain crossings down uh basically 30 some miles in from stone mountain the beginning of the appalachian trail i got to see literally thousands of people come through misusing the gear and misfitted horribly and i would spend two weeks a year and why two weeks a year because anybody who's trying to do the at they're going to be passing through there in the last week of march or the first week or two of april this is not a wilderness experience this is a horde moving along. Mm -hmm. But uh, those folk, all of whom through several generations of ownership have walked the AT, um, do an incredible job helping people who have done their first 10 days to two or three weeks and are uh, in large numbers in freaking agony. Um, and uh, it was a huge privilege for me to be able to spend my last uh, year at Dana, doing two weeks there, and the first couple of years out of Dana doing that and observing how people really use the gear. And you know what? You can try and train them, you can give them manuals, you can give them videos, and you know what? They're gonna keep on using the gear the way they wanna use the gear. So you had better build stuff that will work that way as opposed to hey, here's a few simple things that you need to do and it'll be a lot better. And my Dana design stuff, I mean, we had tech reps out there training dealers and this and that and the rest, and it was utterly futile. So better work with how people are gonna actually use it as opposed to have a fantasy that you'll be able to change them. Yeah, observation and research are, are the corners that get cut. Um, before a designer just starts to jump in and create features, right? That they think will be good. Um, mm -hmm. you know, fe fe we think that features or will, will you're solve every doing problem. It wrong. Yeah. You're doing it wrong and yep. we're here to help. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no one wants to hear that they're doing it wrong, right? That's the yep. last thing people want well, to hear. And what it come around to for us is we had to design stuff that will work pretty damned well, used horribly, and will be awesome if you do a few simple things uh, mm. but that pretty darned well part is actually the key right well d d when you got into this you probably never envisioned a website called Carryology existing right and <laughs> and, and uh, oh my god and people yeah, no, being obsessed, so Japanese. <laughs> right well and being so obsessed with packs that that kind of is what inspired that question is there's just well, a, a, yeah, a culture I have to admit I, I don't want to piss off Taylor or anything, but you know what? The important thing is to get out and use whatever you have. not using the perfect thing for mm -hmm. whatever you are planning to do a little bit of. But it is an incredibly fascinating gameplay, role play, um, and that people are that attached to it. I mean, I'm, I'm honored in a way. I'm also mildly horrified at times, but uh, I mean, it's so cool. Well, it's thanks, it's thanks to this subculture um, 
you know, probably reviving a company like Clutter, Clutterworks, right? You know, or, and certainly out of the Japanese market, right? There's that interest in, mm -hmm. in the heritage of the industry. Um, and I see that driving a lot of rebirth of, of some of these companies. We're kind of seeing that Clutterworks Wilderness Experience. I know Jim and Greg got, got the trademark back for that and started, started a, a version of it again. A company like Whole U Bar being revived, you know, al although it's very different than it what is. it was. Yeah, it's actually um, it's an Italian design firm that has some offices in New York. So it's definitely more of the fashion play, but but they're it, it looks like they're making quality product, but they're leaning really heavily on that heritage. Um, and so I see more of that happening, right? And it's because of you know cariology and people who are interested in that heritage and history diving mm -hmm. into it that that's that's happening but um although frankly in a number of cases the only heritage or history is the name itself mm. and uh i don't know i have a ghana out there who owns the dana design name oh really oh yeah yeah interesting we'll see what happens um our friends at uh Newell Rubbermaid, who bought Jardin, who bought uh, K2. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. So it's living were, over there with Newell. No, no, oh, Newell okay. abandoned it, and oh, nobody and knew. someone else picked it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so interesting. Yeah. So, y'all, whoever feels like trading on my name, especially when Mystery Ranch exists and has gone so much further, it's going to be some very loud laughter. <laughs> well, can I tell you? Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> well, kind of maybe a final question. Um, I know I've taken up your whole morning, but uh, what keeps you doing this after 40 plus years? I am having the time of my life. Seriously. We get to solve interesting problems for interesting people some of whom have a choice about what they're doing, many of whom have no choice. We can make a difference. And that's very addictive. I love it. Well, I think we'll leave it there unless you have any parting thoughts, but I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Well, whatever you do, and you better have some fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great lesson. Um, well, Dana, I appreciate you taking time at, at three hours of your time. Um, I appreciate you being willing to share a little bit and I appreciate everything that you're doing for the program. We didn't even touch on, on that since, since some of that's not public yet. Um, we'll probably air this by the time some of that is public, but, but you're doing a lot for us. So we again, we do a lot of things with a lot of people and it's what you do is important. Yes. We talk about it. You'll hear about it on our website as well, but uh, what you do is much more important than what you tell people about. Right. No, I love that. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. Um, appreciate you taking time and I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more here in the future. So. Well, thanks, Chase. It's been a gas. Mm -hmm.